Section 6 of The Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anne Boulay. Lives of the Queens of England, Volume 2, by Agnes and Elizabeth Strickland. Eleanor of Provence, Chapter 1, Part 2. While the king and queen were still residing at the palace of Woodstock, about three months after the birth of their heir, an attempt was made on the life of the king by a mad poet named Ribald, or Ribot, who, according to some chroniclers, was a gentleman and a knight. One day he rushed into the royal presence, and, before the whole court, called upon Henry to resign the crown, which he had usurped and so long detained from him. The officers of the household forced him out of the presence chamber, and would have inflicted a severe chastisement upon him, if the kind-hearted monarch had not interposed, and charged them, not to hurt a man who talks so like a person out of his senses. The king told them, to take him into his hall, and entertain him hospitably, and let him go. This was done, and Ribot got into high spirits, and began to be very amusing to the royal retinue, joculating for their entertainment, and singing some choice minstrelsy. Thus he whiled away the time till dark, when he stole into the king's bedchamber through a window, armed with a long sharp knife, and concealed himself among the rushes under the king's bed. Henry, fortunately for himself, passed that night in the queen's chamber, and Ribald, rising up at midnight, stabbed the bolster of the royal bed several times, searching for the king in vain, and demanding where he was, in a loud roaring voice, which so alarmed Margaret Bisset, one of the queen's maids of honor, who was sitting up late reading a devout book by the light of a lamp, that her shrieks awakened the king's servants, who took him into custody. The unhappy creature was executed at Coventry for this offense. The following year two other uncles of the queen, Thomas, Count of Savoy, and Boniface, his younger brother, visited England, and Henry, at a complaisance to his consort, received and entertained them with such magnificence, that, not knowing how to support the charge by honest means, he sent word to the Jews, that unless they presented him with twenty thousand marks, he would expel them all the kingdom, and thus he supplied himself with money for his unjust generosity. The death of St. Edmund, Archbishop of Canterbury, furnished Henry with a further opportunity of obliging Eleanor, by obtaining the nomination of her uncle Boniface to the primacy of England. Matthew of Westminster, as well as Paris, informs us that Eleanor wrote, with her own hand, a very elegant epistle to the Pope in his behalf, taking upon herself, says the worthy chronicler, who appears to have been highly scandalized, at female interference in ecclesiastical affairs, for no other reason than his relationship to her, to urge the cause of this unsuitable candidate in the warmest manner. And so, he continues, my lord the Pope, when he had read the letter, thought proper to name this man, who had been chosen by a woman, and it was commonly said that he was chosen by female intrigue. Among other proofs of Eleanor's unbounded influence over the mind of her lord, it was observed, that when, on the death of Gilbert Mariscal, Earl of Pembroke, his brother Walter demanded of the king the office of Earl Marshal, which was hereditary in his family, Henry at first, in a great passion, denied him, telling him, that his two brothers were a pair of turbulent traitors, and that he had presumed to attend a tournament at which he had forbidden him to be present. Yet, when the earl, having succeeded in interesting Queen Eleanor in his favor, again preferred his suit, it was immediately granted through her powerful intercession. Queen Eleanor presented her royal husband, with a daughter in the year 1241, who was named Margaret, after the elder sister of Eleanor, the Queen of France. The following year, the queen accompanied the king her husband on his ill-advised expedition against her brother-in-law, the King of France, with whom that peace-loving monarch had suffered himself to be involved in a quarrel, to oblige his mother, Isabella of Angoulême. The king and queen embarked at Portsmouth, May 19, 1242. 
Henry was totally unsuccessful in his attacks on the King of France, and, after a series of defeats, took refuge with his queen at Bordeaux, to the great scandal of all his English knights and nobles, many of whom forsook their sovereign, and returned home, which Henry revenged in the usual way, by finding their estates. Eleanor gave birth to another daughter at Bordeaux, whom she named Beatrice, after her mother, the Countess of Provence. In consequence of the close connection between their queens, Louis the Ninth was induced to grant a truce of five years to his vanquished foe. Henry and Eleanor then resolved to spend a merry winter at Bordeaux, where they amused themselves with as much feasting and pageantry as if Henry had obtained the most splendid victories, although he was much impoverished by losing his military chest and his movable chapel royal, with all its rich plate, at the Battle of Taliborg. When Henry and Eleanor returned to England, they landed at Portsmouth, and orders were issued that the principal inhabitants of every town on the route to London should testify their loyal affection by coming forth on horseback in their best array to meet and welcome their sovereign and his queen. During the residence of the royal family on the continent, Queen Eleanor strengthened her interest by bringing about a union between her youngest sister, Cynthia, or Sancha, and the king's brother, Richard, Earl of Cornwall, who had recently become a widower. The marriage was solemnized in England, whither the Countess of Provence conducted the affianced bride in the autumn of the same year. Henry called upon the Jews to furnish the funds for the splendid festivities, which he thought proper to ordain in honor of the nuptials between his brother and the sister of his queen. One Jew alone, the rich Aaron of York, was compelled to pay no less than 400 marks of gold and 4,000 of silver, and the Jews of London were mulked in like proportion. The charge Henry was at, on account of this marriage, may be estimated by the wedding dinner alone, which consisted of 30,000 dishes. The king, says the chroniclers of that day, thought he could never do enough to testify his love for the queen and her family. The Countess of Provence, not contented with the splendor of her entertainment, thought proper, before she departed, to borrow 4,000 marks of the king for the use of her husband. The misconduct of Eleanor's uncles, and their unfitness for the high and responsible situation, in which they were placed in England, may be gathered from the following disgraceful fracas, which took place between the Archbishop Boniface and the monks of St. Bartholomew. In the year 1244, Boniface, Archbishop of Canterbury, thought proper to intrude himself in the Bishop of London's diocese, on a visitation to the Priory of St. Bartholomew. The monks, though they liked not his coming, received him with respect, and came out in solemn procession to meet him. But the Archbishop said, he came not to receive their honor, but for the purposes of ecclesiastical visitation. On this, the monks replied, that having a learned bishop of their own, they ought not to be visited by any other. This answer was so much resented by the wrathful primate, that he smote the sub-prior on the face, exclaiming in his ungoverned fury, Indeed, indeed, doth it become ye English traitors thus to withstand me? And with oaths not proper to repeat, he tore the rich cope of the sub-prior to pieces, and trampled it under his feet, and thrust him against a pillar of the chancel, with such violence that he had well nigh slain him. The monks seeing their sub-prior thus maltreated, pushed the archbishop back, and in so doing, discovered that he was encased in armor, and prepared for battle. The archbishop's attendants, who were all Provençals to a man, then fell on the monks, whom they beat, buffeted, and trampled underfoot. The monks, in their rent and miry garments, ran to show their wounds and to complain of their wrongs to their bishop, who bade them go and tell the king thereof. The only four who were capable of getting as far as Westminster proceeded to the palace in a doleful plight, but the king would neither see them nor receive their complaint. The populace of London were, however, in great indignation, and were disposed to tear the archbishop to pieces, pursuing him all the way to Lambeth with execrations, crying aloud, where is this ruffian, this cruel smiter? He is no winner of souls, but an exactor of money, a stranger born, unlearned, and unlawfully elected. 
Boniface fled over to the palace, where he made his story good with the king, through the influence of the queen, his niece, and the monks of St. Bartholomew got no redress. About this time, Henry, it is said, ordered all the poor children, from the streets and highways round Windsor and its neighborhood, to be collected, and munificently feasted in the great hall of the palace there. Afterwards the royal children were all publicly weighed, and their weight in silver distributed in alms among the destitute individuals present, for the good of the souls of the princely progeny of himself and Queen Eleanor. The following year, 1244, the threatened war between England and Scotland, was averted by a contract of marriage, in which the hand of the eldest daughter of Henry and Eleanor, the infant Lady Margaret, was pledged to the heir of Scotland, the eldest son of Alexander the Second. In the beginning of the year 1245, the queen was delivered of her second son, Prince Edmund, the parliament having, in the preceding November, refused an aid to the king. He levied a fine of fifteen hundred marks on the city of London, under the pretense they had sheltered one Walter Buckerell, whom he had banished. Henry was encouraged in his unconstitutional proceedings by a very trivial circumstance. A fire broke out in the Pope's palace, and destroyed the chamber in which the principal deed of Magna Carta was kept, which made the queen fancy that it was rendered null and void. England was at this period in such a state of misrule, that in Hampshire no jury dared to find a bill against any plunderer. Nor was the system of universal pillage confined to the weak and undefended, since Matthew Paris declares, King Henry complained to him, that when he was traveling with the queen through that county, their luggage was robbed, their wine drunk, and themselves insulted by the lawless rabble. Such was the insurgent state of Hampshire, that King Henry could find no judge or justiciary, who would undertake to see the laws duly executed. In this dilemma, he was forced to sit on the bench of justice himself, in Winchester Castle, and no doubt, the causes determined by him would have been well worth the attention of modern reporters. While thus presiding personally on the king's bench, Henry had occasion to summon Lord Clifford to answer at this justice seat, for some malefaction. When the turbulent Miss Dewar not only contumaciously refused his attendance, but forced the king's officers to eat the royal warrant, seal and all, Henry punished him with spirit and courage. One great cause of the queen's unpopularity in London, originated from the unprincipled manner in which she exercised her influence to compel all vessels freighted with corn, wool, or any peculiarly valuable cargo, to unlaid their cargoes at her height, or quay, called queen height, because at that port, the dues of which formed a part of the revenues of the queen consorts of England. The tolls were paid according to the value of the lading. This arbitrary mode of proceeding was without parallel on the part of her predecessors, and was considered as a serious grievance by the masters of vessels and merchants in general. At last Eleanor, for a certain sum of money, sold her rights in this quay to her brother-in-law, Richard, Earl of Cornwall, who, for a quit rent of fifty pounds per annum, let it as a fee farm to John Gisors, the mayor of London, for the sake of putting an end to the perpetual disputes between the merchants of London and the Queen. In order to annoy the citizens of London, Henry, during the disputes regarding the Queen's gold, revived the old Saxon custom of conveying folk moats, and by this means reminded the commons, as the great body of his subjects were called, that they had a political existence no less than the barons of England, and they never again forgot it. Modern writers have asserted that there was no middle class in the days of the Plantagenets. What, then, may we ask, were the citizens of London, those munificent and high-spirited merchants, whose wealth so often in this reign excited the cupidity of the court? If the conduct of the king and queen towards this class of their subjects had been guided by a more enlightened policy, they might have found in their loyal affection no trivial support against Leicester, and the disaffected aristocracy of England. But excited by the rapacity of Eleanor, the king pillaged and outraged the citizens, till they threw their weight into the scale of the mighty adversity of the monarchy. Queen Eleanor was somewhat relieved from her pecuniary difficulties, by the death of the queen mother, Isabella, in 1246. 
she was put after this event in full possession of the dower lands appointed for the english queens she however appropriated her replenished purse to the use of her mother who now a widow paid another visit to england to the great indignation of henry the king was discontented at the manner in which count berenger had disposed of provence to the exclusion of his eldest daughters he was besides very little able to afford gifts to his wife's mother since he had not at that very time withal to meet his household expenses he was advised as the parliament refused to assist him with more money to raise the sum required to satisfy his clamorous creditors by selling his plate and jewels but where shall i find purchasers if money be so scarce demanded the king in the city of london was the reply on this henry petulantly observed if the treasures of augustus caesar were in the market the city of london would purchase them i suppose those clownish citizens who call themselves barons are an inexhaustible treasury in themselves with the determination of participating in some of this envied wealth henry and eleanor thought proper to keep the christmas of twelve forty eight in the city of london and extorted presents from the most liberal of the leading men there to the amount of upwards of two thousand marks this was however far from satisfying the royal visitors henry complained that he had not been treated with sufficient respect and to testify his displeasure proclaimed a fair in tothill fields for the benefit of the men of westminster which was to last a fortnight and during that period he forbade the citizens of london to open their shops for any sort of traffic to the great injury of trade in henry's thirty-fourth year occurs his order to the master of the temple that he delivered to henry of the wardrobe for two years use a certain great book which is at his house in london written in french containing the acts of the king of antioch and of other kings it had been compiled and illuminated under the care of henry himself and if it was as supposed relating to the crusading provencal princes of antioch it would be a valuable history the extreme straits to which the king and queen were at times reduced for the money they profusely lavished may be gathered from the fact that in the twenty-seventh year of his reign henry being without the means of paying the officers of the chapel royal at windsor issued an order to john mansell directing him to pawn the most valuable image of the virgin mary for the sum required but under a special condition that this hallowed pledge be deposited in a decent place in the year twelve forty nine the royal coffers being entirely exhausted and the parliament refusing to grant any aid henry proceeded to practise the degrading expedient of soliciting loans and gifts of every person of condition who entered his presence assuring them that it would be a greater act of charity to bestow money on him than on those who went from door to door begging an alms the king and queen were next seized with an unwanted fit of economy and not only forbear to make expensive grants and donations but put all their servants on short allowance abridged their wages and refused to disperse any of the gratuities which the kings and queens of england had been accustomed to bestow they ceased to put on their royal robes and to save the expense of keeping a table they daily invited themselves with their son prince edward and a chosen number of their foreign kindred or favorites to dine with the rich men of the city of london or the great men of the court and manifested much discontent unless presented with costly gifts at their departure which they took not as obligations or proofs of loyal affection to their persons but as matters of right the cry of the land in that reign was against foreign influence and foreign oppression and it was a proverb that no one but a provencal or a poictivin had any hopes of advancement either in the state or church and which were held in the greatest abhorrence the half-brothers of the king or the uncles of the queen it was difficult to say on st dunstan's day twelve fifty one queen eleanor's apartments in windsor castle were struck by lightning and the chimney of the room where she and the royal children were was thrown down by the violence of the shock and reduced to dust in the parks many oaks were rent asunder and uprooted mills with their millers sheepfolds with their shepherds 
and husbandmen in their fields were by the same awful storm beaten to the earth and destroyed the year however closed more auspiciously than it commenced with the espousals of the princess margaret the eldest daughter of henry and eleanor then in her tenth year to the young king of scotland alexander the third who was about twelve the nuptials were celebrated with great pomp at york where the royal families of england and scotland kept their christmas together the youthful bridegroom was knighted by king henry in york cathedral on christmas day in the presence of the whole court and the next morning the marriage was solemnized at an early hour henry endeavoured to persuade the young alexander to pay him homage for the realm of scotland but the princely boy excused himself with good address from the performance of this important ceremony by replying that he came to york to be married not to discuss an affair on which he being a minor could determine nothing without consulting the states of his kingdom henry finding his son-in-law was of so determined a spirit could not find it in his heart to break up the nuptial festivities by insisting on his demand especially as the archbishop of york had generously promised to be at the expense of all the entertainment which cost him upwards of four thousand marks and six hundred oxen which says matthew paris were all consumed at one meal more worthy of remembrance however than these enormous devourings of the hospitable archbishop's beef does the worthy chronicler consider the dignified and princely conduct of the youthful majesty of scotland at his bridal feast and the amiable manner in which he supplicated on his knees with clasped hands to his royal father-in-law for the pardon of philip lovell one of his ministers who lay under the king's heavy displeasure at that time the royal bride joined in the petition kneeling with her newly wedded lord at her father's feet and hanging on his garments henry was so moved by the artless earnestness of their supplications as to be only able to articulate one word willingly and all who sat at the feast melted into tears of tenderness and admiration the object for whom these interesting pleaders used such powerful intercessions was an unworthy peculator convicted of receiving bribes in the discharge of his office nevertheless the misjudging sovereign was persuaded by the engaging prattle of the two inexperienced children to invest him with the tempting office of treasurer no doubt the royal supplicants had received their cue from the queen or some person who possessed the means of influencing them to make an appeal in favor of lovell for it is very improbable that at their tender age they would have thought of him at such a time the extravagance of dress at these nuptials has been noted by many writers matthew paris declares the nobility were arrayed in vests of silk called cointoises or quintises and the day after the nuptial ceremony the queen of england and her ladies laid these new robes aside and appeared clad in others still more costly and of a new pattern the robes quintises thus named to express their fanciful quaintness were upper or super tunics with no sleeves or very short ones bordered with van dyking or scalloping worked and notched in various patterns scarfs were worn by knights a la quintis meaning that they were ornamented with a notched border the quintus robe was worn by queen eleanor so long before and behind as to trail on the ground and was held up with one hand lest her steps should be impeded the roman de la rose speaking of these garments first worn by eleanor and her court counsels the ladies if their feet and ankles be not small and delicate to let their robes fall on the pavement and hide them whilst those whose feet are of a beautiful form may hold up the robe in front for the convenience of stepping along briskly he uncivilly compares the ladies to pies and peacocks which he says delight in feathers of various colors so do our court ladies the pies have long tails that train in the dirt but the ladies make their tails a thousand times longer than the peacocks and the pies ladies headdresses were singularly elegant in the youth and middle age of this beautiful queen the hair was gathered up under a golden network over which was thrown the veil or coverchief those women who ventured to walk in the street with only the call garland or bandeaux without the sheltering veil or coverchief were deemed improper characters and liable to insult 
the unmarried females wore their hair flowing in ringlets on their shoulders or if their tresses were very long and luxuriant braided in two tails and tied with ribbons or a knot of gems at the ends the veil surmounted with a bandeau was assumed when they rode or walked in the open air the queen is sometimes represented with the homely goret or wimple in illuminations of that time the goret fashion imitated in cambric or lawn the knight's helmet with an aperture cut like the visor for the face to peep through and very lovely that face must have been which did not look ugly through so hideous an envelope the felicity which the king and queen enjoyed in the magnificent celebration of their daughter's union with the scottish king was interrupted by the return of henry's discarded favorite simon de montfort earl of leicester who had passed six years in a sort of honorable banishment as governor of gascony deputies had been sent from that province with complaints of leicester's tyrannical conduct and he having succeeded in refuting the charges of his gascon foes proceeded to call upon the king to reward him for his services reminding him of his royal promise to that effect henry with infinite scorn replied that he did not consider himself obliged to keep his word with a traitor leicester fiercely told the sovereign he lied and were he not his king he would make him eat his words adding that it was scarcely possible to believe he was a christian or ever had made confession of his sins yes replied the king i am a christian and have often been at confession what signifies confession retorted the earl without repentance i never repented of anything so much in my life rejoined the insulted monarch as having bestowed favors on one who has so little gratitude and such ill manners after this characteristic dialogue there was nothing but hatred between the king and his insolent brother-in-law to add to the troubles of the king and queen at this juncture even so late as the year twelve fifty two the validity of his marriage with eleanor was perpetually agitated at the court of rome owing to the king's capricious breach of promise with the countess of ponthieu and this year he was forced to obtain bulls at a great expense from pope innocent declaring the contract of the king of england with joanna who had been long married to the king of castile null and void and his marriage with eleanor of provence good matrimony in a little time we shall see the heir of henry and the young daughter of joanna enter into wedlock henry's temper now became so irascible that he quarrelled with his best friends he was more extortionate than ever and demanded of the clergy a tenth of their revenues towards the expenses of a projected crusade he sent for the bishop of eli who appeared to have great influence with his brethren and endeavored by flattering caresses to secure his interest but when this conscientious prelate attempted to reason with him on the folly of his conduct henry angrily retorted that he did not require any of his counsels and ordered his officers to turn him out of doors for an ill-bred fellow as he was louis the ninth of france and the gallant retinue of noble crusaders by whom he had been attended on his ill-starred expedition to palestine were at this time languishing in the most doleful captivity and the flower of the french chivalry had fallen victims either to the pestilence or the sword the luxurious eleanor of provence talked of accompanying her feeble-minded lord in a crusade for their aid but it was not probable that she would have abandoned her painted chambers and jewelled pomp to expose herself to the perils of hardship and privations like those which her sister was suffering at damietta the queen was this year again in imminent danger from a thunderstorm she was with her children visiting the abbey of st albans when lightning struck the chimney of her chamber and shivered it to pieces the abbey laundry burst into flames while such a commotion was raised by the elements that the king's chief justice who was escorting two treasure carts and had accepted hospitality at the abbey thinking the whole structure was devoted to destruction rushed forth into the highway with two friars and as they went they fancied a flaming torch or a drawn sword preceded them the same summer henry made preparations for going in person to quell the formidable revolt in guienne occasioned by the recall of the earl of leicester and the misgovernment of prince edward who had been appointed as his successor in the fourteenth year of his age 
Queen Eleanor, being near her confinement, did not accompany the king, but was solemnly invested by her departing lord with the regency of the kingdom. Jointly with his brother Richard, Earl of Cornwall, the husband of her sister Sancha of Provence. While Henry was waiting in the neighborhood of Portsmouth for a favorable wind, he made his will, which was a very interesting document, affording proof of his affection for his queen, and the unbounded confidence which he reposed in her. Henry the Third's Will I, Henry, King of England, Duke of Normandy, and Aquitaine, and Earl of Anjou, on the Tuesday after St. Peter and St. Paul, in the year of grace, 1253, at Southwick, proposing to go to Gascony, I make my will in the form following. I will that my body be buried in the church of the blessed Edward of Westminster, there being no impediment, having formerly appointed my body to be buried in the new temple of London. I commit the guardianship of Edward, my eldest son and heir, and of my other children, and of my kingdom of England, and all my other lands in Wales, and Ireland, and Gascony, to my illustrious Queen Eleanor, until they arrive at full age. Also I bequeath the cross which the Countess of Kent gave me, to the small altar of the aforesaid church of Westminster. Though he lived many years after, Henry never made another will. King Henry, attended by the greater number of his barons, sailed from Portsmouth, August 6th. He arrived at Bordeaux on the 15th of the same month, and took the command of his army in person. On the 25th of November, Eleanor gave birth to a daughter in London, who was christened with great pomp by the Archbishop of Canterbury, the Queen's uncle. That primate also stood godfather for the infant princess, and bestowed upon her the name of Catherine, because she was born on St. Catherine's Day. She died very young, and was buried in Westminster Abbey, by her two brothers, Richard and John, the third and fourth sons of Henry and Eleanor, who had preceded her to the tomb. These royal children repose in the space between the chapels of St. Edward and St. Benet. End of section 6